Well, hello, dear friends. Welcome to our program, I'd Like to Know. This is a question and answer program where we give uh, those who watch our program uh, the chance of asking questions uh, based on the Bible uh, that perhaps they can't find an answer to. And uh, we do the research and we do everything possible to find the answer to the question for those who send them to us. I just want to give you the address uh, where you can send your questions and uh, we will do everything possible to answer those questions. It'll be on the screen, tv at sumtv.org. Once again, tv at sumtv.org. Uh, we will do our utmost if there is an answer to try and find the answer for you. I have with me uh, Pastor Daniel Miranda who uh, is associate speaker here at Secrets Unsealed mm -hmm. and uh, also coordinates our Spanish speaking work. His wife does social media uh, for our Spanish speaking work here at the ministry. We're glad to have him, very level headed when it comes to theology, which is what we like to have here at Secrets Unsealed. We're very glad that you're here. Thank you, Pastor Bori. It's a, it's a privilege for me to be here learning from the voice of experience. <laughs> well, praise the Lord. <laughs> Okay, we have several very good questions today, but before we get into the questions, we want to do what we always do before we open the Word, and that is to ask the Lord to be with us. So if you could please pray for us that the Lord will bless the program. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you again, and we want to ask you for your guidance and your help in answering these questions. You know that your children have sent them because they sincerely want to do your will and, and know your Bible. So I pray, Lord, that you may enlighten our minds and the minds of those who are watching us. In the name of Jesus, amen. Amen. Okay, what question do we have first today? So this question comes from Jonas Apatu, and the question reads, why do we have to die? Our bodies will get rotten and then to be resurrected again. So his question is, why, why to die? and then our bodies will, be, will get rotten and then we'll resurrect again. I think the answer is found in the three-letter word, S-I-N, sin. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah, that was exactly what I was going to say. Would we have to go back to Genesis chapter 3 yeah. uh, to find out uh, why death comes into the world? Mm -hmm. Yeah, Genesis chapter uh, 3, actually even chapter 2, when mm -hmm. God yeah. gives the command not uh, to eat from the forbidden tree, and He also gives a word. Yeah. Yes, Genesis 2, 15 through 17. Then the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to tend and to keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. Mm -hmm. So we were not created to die, but sin entered into the world, and then came, death came as a result, and then our bodies die, uh, we rotten, that's true, but then the resurrection is the most amazing thing, because God makes all things new with right. a glorified body, and we can live again and be with Jesus if we have been faithful for eternity. Yeah, in fact, in Genesis chapter 3 and verse 19, God pronounced the sentence upon Adam and okay. the entire human race mm -hmm. when he said, In the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground, because he was brought forth from the ground. For, for out of you were taken, out of it you were taken, for dust you are, and to dust you shall return. Yes. So Adam was made of dust, and because of sin he returned to the dust. But the good news is that um, when Jesus comes, He's going to recreate Adam and all those who are in Christ, and then we will have a body uh, incorruptible and immortal like it was before sin at the very beginning. Amen. Maybe we could go to 1 Corinthians 15, and I know this is not mentioned in the question, but just to uh, add and clarify more what our brother here is asking. Is it really a big deal or is it really difficult for God to resurrect us even though our bodies are eaten and rotten? 
that's not a problem for mm. God. Um, someone, verse 35 says, but someone will say, how are the dead raised up? And with what body do they come? Verse 36, foolish one, what you sow is not made alive unless it dies. And what you sow, you do not sow that body that shall be but mere grain, perhaps wheat or some other grain. But God gives it a body as he pleases and to each seed its own body. So what is the illustration here? What you put into, into the ground is not the same thing that comes up. Right. It's a different body. The same thing, what goes into the grave is not the same thing that comes up. And then the point here is verse 42 and 44, through 44. So also is the resurrection of the dead. The body is sown in corruption. It is raised in incorruption. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. There is a natural body and there is a spiritual body. Okay, so basically, uh, between these two points of time is sin. Yes. You know, in a world of sin, things corrupt, things get old, mm -hmm. things get wrinkled because of sin. Mm. But when everything is restored, there will no longer be any of that. It Amen. will be like God originally planned if man should not sin. Mm -hmm. Amen. Very okay, good. so I hope that that uh, answer is uh, satisfactory. Uh, we have another question uh, that, you know, we have answered in a previous program. Uh, this question uh, is asked by Kathy Cook. And um, the question is this, as God is all-knowing, would it have been possible to just not create Satan? Will you please answer this question? Would it have been possible because God, uh, God says, well, you know, I know that if I create Lucifer, Lucifer is going to sin, so I better not create him. I, I better save myself the mess. <laughs> uh, could God think that way? No. Why not? Well, that would be very, uh, that would be a selfish thought uh, from God. Um, if, that were, if that were the case, then most of us should have never been born because we're going to sin and we're going to create or give him a, a big problem. It will be the, the only solution whenever this question comes up, I usually answer. <clears throat> the only solution for God to never, for, for sin to never enter the universe is for the Godhead to stay by themselves without creating any being because then he is the only one that is perfect and the only one that will never have the possibility of sinning. But the fact that we are created and have free will, we will always have the possibility of falling. And that was the case in heaven. And unfortunately, that happened with Lucifer. But God gave him the chance, as he gave the chance to every heavenly being. Yeah, you know, the Bible makes it clear that even in heaven, uh, the beings had freedom of choice. Yes. Because uh, Satan, not only did Satan choose to go against God, but he took a third of the angels that chose to follow him. Mm -hmm. So God guarantees freedom of choice. We notice also in the book of Genesis that God respects freedom of choice. He placed a, a tree in the garden and he said, you know, you can eat from all the trees of the garden, that's good. But if you eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, that's evil. Mm -hmm. So that cl the tree of knowledge of good and evil sh proves that God gave Adam and Eve freedom of choice Amen. as he gives us freedom mm. of choice. Now, what would we think of a God who created beings with no freedom of choice? There's no capacity to love mm -hmm. without freedom of choice because you choose <clears throat> whom you're going to love. Yes. So let's suppose that God uh, thought to himself, not anybody else, but he's thinking to himself, you know, I know that if I create Lucifer, and Lucifer is going to choose evil and it's going to cause all of this mess in the universe. You know, I'll just choose not to create him. Nobody will know that I chose not to create him but me. Mm. God would be going against his principles. Yes. Because he would be creating beings only who could say yes mm -hmm. and not no. Yeah. 
So God, it, God respected so much freedom of choice that he was willing to have Lucifer sin and create this mess and Adam and Eve sin and <laughs> make the mess even more complicated because he respects fully and completely freedom of choice. <laughs> and usually we think of this from the perspective of, of us. So, you know, God created Lucifer and he created Adam and Eve and he knew all of this mess, you know, all the crime and all the drugs and all these things. Uh, didn't God care about us? But we don't think about how much sin cost God. Mm. He, saw, he suffered much more than us yes. uh, because of sin. So uh, why didn't God just say, you know, I know that it's going to be painful for me, so I'm not going to create Adam and Eve. I'm not going to create Satan because uh, Lucifer, because if I do, you know, it's going to cause suffering for me. No, he didn't spare himself the suffering. Exactly. He still created Adam and Eve and he created Lucifer knowing the pain that it was going to co cost him, not only us. Yes, amen. Very good. All right. Uh, what is the next question? So the next question, let me see here, okay, comes from, well, we don't find the name here, Lily, I think. Stargazer Lily. Stargazer Lily, yes. Hello, thank you very much for the wonderful blessing of the Matthew 24 study series. I had a question in regard to the references for the following statement, and then she quotes, the eye of providence is a Masonic symbol representing Lucifer, the great architect of the universe. And then she's quoting from lesson number six, page 72 in your study guides. When I try to look into this on the web, all I find are claims that this represented the all-seeing eye of God's providence, not Lucifer. Many history sources seem to state thinking it represented Lucifer in a conspiracy belief. May I have reference support for it representing Lucifer? Okay, that's a good question. The only documentation that I have is that in the city of Haverstraw, New York, many years ago, I was invited to give a series of meetings. And uh, that series of meetings was held in a Masonic temple. Huh. And uh, it was amazing to really speak. And there was kind of eerie because they had all kind of, uh, all kind of wood art where they had... Uh, you know, different beasts and dragons and all different kinds of uh, occultic symbols. And interestingly enough, I saw there in the Masonic, Masonic temple the same insignia that is found on the $1 bill. Uh, the, the pyramid that is not, uh, you know, complete with a, with a sunburst above it. And uh, it was in the Masonic temple. Hmm. And uh, so from there... I concluded that that is not really a Christian symbol, but it's a Masonic symbol. And by the way, practically all of those that devised this uh, great seal of the United States were Masons. Mm -hmm. You know, the founding fathers of the United States were Freemasons. And uh, President Roosevelt was a Freemason. And, uh, and you know, he's the, he's the one who decided to place uh, the great seal on the, on the $1 bill. So uh, it's based on my observation that I brought that forth in the Matthew chapter 24 series, uh, not from any documentation that I found on Google. Okay. Okay? Interesting. All right. Uh, we have uh, the next question is actually a collection of five questions. <laughs> <laughs> and they are sent to us by, hmm, who is that guy? <laughs> Obviously a pseudonym. <laughs> so anyway, uh, here's question number one. I have studied that our bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit, 1 Corinthians 3.16, that there is a temple of God in heaven as well, that we are the bride of Christ, faithful servants of the Lord, the sheep of God, our shepherd, and children of God. But how do I fathom these terms which apply to God's people? So how do we apply the idea that the temple of God is God's people and also a temple, a literal temple in heaven. Well, I, I don't see, I don't know if I understand the question very well because then it says, how do I fathom these terms? I'm not sure if he's referring to the different terms to God's people, bride of Christ, faithful servants, 
sheep of our God, our shepherd and children of God, and, and, and the reference to, to the heavenly sanctuary. But um, I think your question is close to the sense of, of the question that the person is asking. Well, when we go to the Bible, we find both literal temples and spiritual temples. Mm -hmm. We find first <coughs> uh, the Mosaic Temple. Actually, if we even go before, we have the, the Eden Temple that was kind of like a sanctuary. We have uh, the temple built by Moses. We, find, we have the tabernacle. temple, the tabernacle, yes. We have uh, uh, Solomon's temple, but actually it was built by Solomon. Then Zerubbabel's, which right. was later remodeled by Herod. Okay, those are the literal temples. When we come to the New Testament, then the temple acquires more spiritual sense because now the, earth, the earthly temple lost its significance. Uh, when Jesus left the temple, he says, your house is made unto you desolate. So we have Jesus himself applies uh, the symbology of the temple to himself. His body destroyed his temple. Right. And I will raise it up uh, in the third day. So his body was the temple. The church is also described as a temple, I believe, in Ephesians chapter 2. And then we, as individuals, as described as a temple. So this doesn't contradict the fact that in heaven there is a temple, which is the true one. So wherever Jesus is, that's literal. Wherever the Holy Spirit is, that's spiritual. Since the Holy Spirit is here on earth interceding for us, so everything related to the work of the Holy Spirit must be understood as spiritual, even the temples. Mm -hmm. But where Jesus is in heaven, that is the literal temple. Yeah, and um, just to refer to the passage that you mentioned a few moments ago, uh, Ephesians chapter 2, uh, which is speaking about the spiritual temple of the church. The church, exactly. It says, Now therefore you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets. See, the foundations are spiritual foundations. They're people, mm -hmm. uh, not, uh, not literal stones. Uh, so it says, built, having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, not a literal cornerstone, it's a person. Mm. And then it says, in whom the whole building being fitted together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. We are the stones that are built upon the foundation and the chief cornerstone. And then notice verse 22, in whom you also are being built together for a dwelling place of God in the Spirit. So God wants the Holy Spirit to be in the church. God wants the Holy Spirit to be in us. And of course the Spirit uh, lives in the heavenly temple. Mm -hmm. It's the glory, the Shekinah of yes. God. And so there's no contradiction between a literal heavenly temple, uh, the body being the temple, and the church being the temple. There are different ways of teaching the same truth that the Holy, Spirit's want, Holy Spirit wants to dwell in each one. Amen. Okay, then we have a second question uh, here. The earthly sanctuary was a pattern of the sanctuary in heaven. Earthly sanctuary had animal sacrifices, what was the heavenly sanctuary's ultimate sacrifice and was it done in heaven? In other words, was the sacrifice made in heaven? No, it was not. And the book of Hebrews, the author of Hebrews clearly points to Jesus' sacrifice and the, as the ultimate sacrifice. Mm -hmm. um, so the work of, on earth of Jesus Christ corresponds to the work on the outer court. Right. Okay. So we see Jesus' sacrifice on the altar of sacrifice and his resurrection on the labor. Right. Um, there is no sacrifice in heaven because Jesus' sacrifice is enough. Yet the book of Hebrews says that he entered the heavenly sanctuary with his own blood. With his own blood, exactly. But it was the blood that he shed on earth. Mm -hmm. In other words, Jesus is not sacrificed in heaven. He's sacrificed on earth and then he takes his blood into the sanctuary in heaven. Amen. Because as you mentioned, the court, the work of the court takes place on earth and the work of the holy place and the most holy place takes place in the heavenly sanctuary. And perhaps I read a text to back up our answer. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 23. Mm -hmm. Therefore, it was necessary that the copies of the things in the heavens 
should be purified with this, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. For Christ has not entered the holy places made with hands, which are the copies of the true, but in heaven itself now to appear in the presence of God for us. Not that he should offer himself often, mm -hmm. as the high priest enters the most holy place every year with the blood of another. He then would have had to suffer often since the foundation of the world. But now, once at the end of the ages, he has appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. So here is the answer. Mm -hmm. So the answer to this particular question is, no, he was not sacrificed in heaven. He was sacrificed on earth, but the efficacy of his blood is in heaven Still where he ministers with his blood before his father. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, the third question in this series of questions is, the earthly sanctuary is cleansed by a high priest as he ministered after the atonement because it was defiled. But why is the heavenly sanctuary with no sin cleansed by Christ who is ministering in the heavenly sanctuary according to Hebrews 8 verse 2? Uh, so how can something as holy as the heavenly sanctuary be defiled by the record of sin is the way that I understand this question. Yes. Well, I perceive there is a misconception in the question in saying that um, the sanctuary in heaven doesn't have sin. Well, but Daniel 8.14 tells us something different. Yes, right. Because Daniel 8.14, which is referring clearly to the heavenly sanctuary, it says that the sanctuary will be cleansed unto 2,300 days. So if it, if it will be cleansed, it means that there are sins recorded in the mm -hmm. heavenly sanctuary. Again, the typology, as the earthly sanctuary recorded the sins of the people throughout the year, so the heavenly sanctuary records the sins of us when we confess. They are recorded there in the books of records. Mm -hmm. And uh, also we need to recognize, you know, because people say, how can something as hideous and defiling as sin be in the presence of a most holy place. Mm -hmm. How can you have sin, which is defiles, in the, such a most holy place in heaven? And I usually answer with, uh, with another example, and that is, was Christ absolutely perfect and holy? Amen. He was. Yes. Yet did he take sin upon himself? He did. By imputation. In other words, the sin in the heavenly sanctuary is imputed to the sanctuary. It is credited to, the, credited to the sanctuary, but it does not belong to the sanctuary, just like our sins were credited to Jesus, but they do not belong to Jesus. That's right. So if Jesus, the most holy and perfect being in the universe, could bear the record of sin, so then uh, very clearly the record of sin can be in heaven in a super holy place, because in the case of the sanctuary and of Jesus, sin does not belong there. It mm -hmm. is alien to there, but it is imputed until uh, the individual who is ultimately responsible for sin bears the final load at the end of the Day of Atonement. Amen. Okay, question number four. I believe he is ministering after his ultimate atonement, but what kind of ministering is what got me thinking? Is there another kind of ministering done by the high priest apart from cleansing the sanctuary? And of course, the answer to that question is yes. Exactly. Uh, you know, the, the high priest also had an intercessory role. Yes. Some, some people have the idea that Jesus ceased his work of intercession mm -hmm. in, in 1844. But uh, in 1844, in the, in the ministry of the Most Holy Place, he continued the work that he was doing. Sure. But now an added function is given. Right. And, and, and is the function of... Uh, of, of the high priest cleansing the sanctuary, mm -hmm. uh, the function of judgment. He's now judgment, he received judgment from the Father uh, to begin the work of judgment on behalf of, on behalf of the saints or in favor of the saints, right. as Daniel 7.22 says. But it doesn't mean that he has ceased to intercede. We know that he will cease to intercede when he leaves the most holy place, when probation closes. Now his steps are on a building pattern. See, uh, he lives his perfect life, and because he lives a perfect life, he dies for sin, he sheds his blood, then he enters into the holy place with his blood to intercede for us, and then in 1844, he enters into the most holy place, continues applying his blood to those who come 
by faith to him, but adding an additional function, which is the function of judgment. Mm -hmm. But he does not cease to do the interceding through his blood and apply his perfect life to those who come to him. So basically, in the most holy place, he has a double function. He's the intercessor until probation closes, and on the other hand, he is also the judge. Amen. Okay, the final question in this series of questions is, why is the temple or heavenly sanctuary disappearing in Revelation 21, 22? And how does it disappear with the actual pattern, Ten Commandments, inside the Ark of the Covenant, which God, God's throne sits on? So why did he not see in the city a temple? Well, um, my answer to that is, um, let, let me read Revelation 21, 22, but I saw no temple in it for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. Uh, the temple had fulfilled already its soteriological function by this point, but the temple, which this time the, the city will function as a temple in the new heavens and the new earth, will continue to play, or I would say uh, function, more in a doxological way, because they will come to worship uh, once a week and once a month a month before the city. So the temple in itself with its scatological and soteriological functions will no longer uh, be in the new heavens and the new earth, but, um, but the city will have now, actually even the dimensions and all that, there are many, so many similarities uh, of the city and the temple uh, uh, there in that specific time. I also recommend that uh, the person who asked the question and those who are watching read the chapter of Ellen White's first vision where she very clearly says that the temple will be on one of the hills outside the city of New exactly. Jerusalem. In other words, that there's no temple in the city. Mm -hmm. The temple is on a mountain outside the city. And so what, uh, what John is saying, I saw no temple in the city. He's not saying that there wasn't any temple. Mm -hmm. So uh, there will still be the ark. It will still have the Ten Commandments in it. Uh, the Ten Commandments will not have been nailed to the cross, as many people believe. Well. Time has flown by. Thank you for joining us. We hope to see you next time on this program, I'd Like to Know.